The keyword static is a very important keyword in C++ and it's used a lot. Honestly, because of a very general name, it is probably a bit overused. Largely speaking, it can be used outside of classes and inside of classes. And these two cases are slightly different. So today we focus on the former, using static outside of classes. If you're interested in how and when to use static inside of classes, I will link that lecture here when it's out. Anyway, as for using static outside of classes, I have good news for you. If you follow my advices about best practices from before, then the rule of thumb for using static outside of classes in modern C++, that is at least C++ 17, is very simple. Don't. Don't use static at all. Technically, that's all you need to know. But uh, if you want to learn why you shouldn't use static outside of classes, then keep watching this video and see how deep this rabbit hole goes. In order to explain why we mostly don't want to use static for anything outside of classes, we will need to talk about why we might want to use static in the first place. The keyword static really controls just two things the storage duration and the linkage. These terms feel a bit technical and I can already feel the confused faces on the other side of the screen. So what do these words really mean? We'll start with storage duration. Every object declared in C++ has a certain lifetime, or in other words, a storage duration. There is a number of storage durations that uh, any variable can have. At this point we care about only two, the automatic storage duration and the static storage duration. To explain the difference between the two, we start with a simple main function that calls another function foo that has a single local variable in it. We can then draw the execution time of the program main and foo functions as lines that indicate that most of the time that uh, the program runs it spends in main and while most of the time in main is spent executing the foo function. If we focus now on the lifetime of the local value variable shown as a blue box in the image, it uh, lives as long as is needed for the execution of the foo function. Its memory is allocated at the start of the function and is freed at the end of the scope. We say that a variable local value and any other variable that lives in some local scope has automatic storage duration. And let's further extend our example by adding some value k value that is defined at namespace scope and use it to initialize our local value. We will introduce it uh, in an unnamed namespace following the best practices, but it could live in any namespace, including the global one. The k value here has what is called a static storage duration. It lives for the whole duration of the program. Its data gets allocated at the start of the program and freed at the end of the program. And while we can use static for an object definition namespace scope to indicate that it has the static storage duration, we don't have to as any such object has static storage duration by default. So all of these definitions are equivalent in terms of uh, the storage duration. Finally, use of static can extend the storage duration of a local variable within some function scope to have the static storage duration. If we add static in front of our local value definition, it will have static storage duration again, even though it is defined in a local scope. Such a static variable will be initialized when first encountered during the program flow and destroyed when the program exits. One interesting peculiarity of using static to extend the storage duration of a local variable is that if the flow of our program encounters the line that defines the static variable multiple times, this line will only be executed once. The reason being is that the variable already exists when the program flow reaches the variable definition for the second time, so the definition is skipped and the existing static variable is simply used further. You can easily see this for yourself if you replace the creation of a static int object by the creation of the static object of your custom type that prints something on construction and maybe destruction. And calling the function foo a couple of times from main, just like we just discussed, your object will only print once from its constructor and destructor. Uh, really, give this a try, it should take you no more than a couple of minutes by now. Now, I have to be honest, this is where I lied to you a little bit about never needing to use static. There are situations when you might want to create a static object within a function, and in our foo function we could have returned a non-const reference and essentially model a global mutable variable that will live for the rest of the program lifetime. This is also very similar to the singleton design pattern, and we will talk about that, um, about what it is and why you probably don't want to use it later in the course. 
Anyway, if you remember what we talked about before, you will know that using non-const global variables tends to wreak havoc and we probably don't want to do that. For completeness, one use for such an improvised singleton is to deal with the static initialization order fiasco. It should not hit you as long as you only create variables that rely exclusively on values within the same translation unit and not across translation unit boundaries. I won't go into details here, but tell me in the comments if you are interested to learn more about it. It's time we sum up where static can be used and what it gives us in terms of changing the storage duration of variables. Generally speaking, when used outside of classes, static can be used in two places. At namespace scope, which adds nothing, as any such variable already has a static storage duration, or inside of functions to extend the local variable's automatic storage duration to the static storage duration, which we mostly don't want to do. So, all in all, there is really no good reason to use static to change storage duration of our variables. So, now it's time to talk about the second thing that static controls, linkage. The topic of linkage is a bit nuanced, and I tried to simplify it as much as I could here, but if I missed something or made a mistake in my strife for simplicity, uh, please comment below this video. Oh, and uh, maybe subscribe once you're at it. Uh, you did make it this far, right? Anyway, back to linkage. So first, let me try to explain what linkage is by describing what it is used for. When we write programs, we name things like our variables, classes, functions, etc. Um, we can think of linkage as a property of any such given name. This property basically controls if a name of any symbol can correspond, or in other words, be linked, to its declaration in a different scope. We distinguish linkage of several levels that control which boundaries such links can cross. No linkage, internal linkage, and external linkage. And let's dive into those. Intuitively speaking, if we want some name to be available only in the current scope, it should have no linkage. As an example, any variable defined in any local scope usually has no linkage. If a name should be available beyond local scopes, but still only from within the same translation unit, think within one CPP file, it should have internal linkage. The typical examples of these are constants defined at namespace scope, any data and functions put into an unnamed namespaces within a CPP file, oh, and also any static data and functions, but more on that in a minute. Finally, external linkage is needed for symbols that need to be available globally throughout the program. Um, these are usually classes, enums, non-static or usually inline functions, and inline constants declared at namespace scope in some header files. In the end, it is up to us which linkage our entities have. We can pick linkage of anything that we declare at declaration time by choosing where we put our declarations, be it local scope, namespace scope, unnamed namespace, etc. And by using keywords such as const, const expert, static, and inline, all of which have their influence on link linkage. As you might start to suspect, the complete rules of how linkage is selected are slightly convoluted, but the good news is that when we write the code, the rules to follow the best practices are pretty simple, and I will summarize them at the end of this lecture. However, in order to read the code written by others, we have to dive a little bit deeper into these convoluted rules. So, to save you the trouble of figuring out all of the intricate details, I came up with this flowchart. If we follow it, we can find out the linkage of any symbol we're looking at. This is helpful to debug code that we did not write and see issues in the code before they happen. Uh, this chart should work with any function or data declaration you might encounter, but first, if you are looking at a function, ignore the return type along with any const qualifiers it might have. Then follow the chart by answering the questions. Let's see a couple of examples uh, that follow best practices. Looking at the k number here, for example, we can follow the chart. Is it in local scope? No, it's not. Is it in unnamed namespace? Nope. Does it use the static keyword? No, it doesn't. Is it in line? Yeah, it is. Which brings us to it having external linkage. And feel free to do this with all the other examples or any other ones that you see in any code that you encounter. Now that we understand more about linkage, let's return back to the topic we actually wanted to chat about. Static and why we mostly don't want to use it for freestanding functions and data. As you can see from the flowchart that we just looked at, static has something of a superpower to decide if some entity has internal or external linkage. Anything that we mark as static will definitely have internal linkage and will only be visible within the same translation unit it is defined in, which has its consequences. 
One of these consequences is that it makes very little sense to declare, and not define, a static function in a header file. Any function will have uh, to be defined in every source file this header will be included in. Not only that, but such a definition will only be seen from within the same source file due to internal linkage that static enforces. Which means that we could have just directly defined this function in any such source file straight away. So don't declare functions in header files as static. Which brings us to the next point. When we do define functions and data in a source file, we can still find some advice on the internet to use static in such definitions. I would argue that this advice is obsolete. If we go back to our chart, we can easily see that while static has a superpower to make anything have internal linkage, the unnamed namespaces have the same superpower. Without going too deep into details, it turns out that they are usually even more powerful in this regard. So if we define some data or functions in some CPP file, we should put them into an unnamed namespace instead of defining them as static. Although technically it won't be a bug. One final place where I could imagine static being used is when defining functions or data in a header file. Now, you might wonder why would anybody want to do this, and the answer is to avoid the one definition rule or ODR violations. Let's dig into this a bit. ODR states roughly this, that any symbol must have exactly one definition in the entire program. That means across all of its translation units. Only inline symbols can have more than one definition, which are then assumed to be exactly the same. If we naively define a function in the header file foo.h and include this file into two source files foo1cpp and foo2cpp, which are then compiled into two libraries, then we already violate ODR. We have two definitions of the function foo in two different translation units. Granted, in this situation these definitions are the same, but there is an awful lot of things that can go wrong from this point on. Considering that ODR violations are not required to be checked by the linker, this can quickly lead us to finding ourselves in the undefined behavior land, which is typically a very painful experience. But that warrants a separate video. Please comment below if you would like this separate video on ODR violations. One way that people sometimes, um, I would say, wrongly fix this is by marking their function static. So in our case, we would make our foo function static in the foo.h header. The reason people do this is that it does help to avoid the ODR violation. Because static enforces internal linkage, the two translation units related to foo1cpp and foo2cpp that include our header will have their own different versions of the foo definition, not visible beyond their respective translation units which means that ODR would not be violated. This approach has one major downside, though. Now every translation unit that includes our header will have its own implementation of foo baked in, which, depending on what functions or data we define, can have a significant impact on the binary size. This can be a problem if we develop for, say, constrained hardware. A proper way to fix this would be to use inline instead of static here. Returning back to our flowchart, the superpower of inline is to enforce external linkage but one that is explicitly allowed by the ODR formulation. So we can change the definition of our foo function to inline inside of our foo.h file. And the same holds for any data. We should mark it as inline const expert or inline const, though. This will lead the binary code for such functions and data to only exist once and to be linked everywhere they are needed while still not violating ODR. Note, though, that using inline is only safe in header files. Avoid using inline in source files as this can lead to its own ODR violations. But that is again probably a story for a different video. For another intuitive explanation on this, I urge you to watch uh, this video by Jason Turner on his C++ Weekly channel. This video is about the differences between static and inline in exactly this context. And I guess this pretty much sums up everything that I wanted to talk about with regards to using static outside of classes today. This has led us down a couple of rabbit holes, linkage being a pretty deep one, but I hope that by now you see that there is really no need to use static outside of classes at all in modern C++. Here is a guideline to follow along with this. When defining variables at namespace scope, always mark them as inline const, or even better, inline const expert. Do not mark them static. When defining variables at local scope, do not mark them static unless you are explicitly implementing a singleton-like design pattern which you probably shouldn't do anyway, stay tuned for that. When declaring functions at namespace scope, declare and define them as inline. Do not use static for this. And when declaring data or functions in an unnamed namespace, 
do not mark them static or inline. Data should be const or const expert still. Understanding the key role that linkage and ODR play here is crucial to understanding what inline and previously static were designed to solve. Initially, static was introduced into the C programming language and then was inherited by C++. It was in the times when C did not even have inline and uh, in C++ it meant something different and could not be used uh, as it can be now. Thankfully, we live in better times now, which makes static close to obsolete when used outside of classes. Now, if you want to know how to use static in classes, you can see a video about that once it's ready and maybe also go back and refresh how inline plays a huge role in creating libraries. And on this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this digging into, into the word static and inline and everything. And um, I hope to see you in the next video. Bye.